Here we go again. We start with news reporters talking about how amazing it was when Jennifer saved the day from influencer Titania. A witness describes how cool it was that she could turn into a chick hulk, to which the reporter replies, a she hulk? This chick, pretty decent, turned into a hulk, like, like a chick hulk. A she hulk? Exactly. It's still hard to believe this isn't a parody. Furthermore, it's a bit strange how excited people in this world are to see another Hulk. Sure, we the audience love the real Hulk, but do the people in this world really feel the same? Wouldn't it make more sense if there is a more fearful reaction to a new Hulk appearing? Traditionally, the public only really knows the Hulk as a terrifying menace that could wreck their homes in any given moment. There's an argument that could suggest that Smart Hulk made the people more comfortable, but it's a bit of a stretch. And it's a shame because there's potential for very powerful drama here that isn't being capitalized on. It would have been tragic if, because of her association with the Hulk, the media framed Jennifer as a monster just as terrifying as how the Hulk used to be, even though we know that she did nothing wrong and only saved innocent lives. Under that context, this witness could be much more compelling as an outlier, going against the grain to say good things about her, then getting painted as a lunatic by the media as a result. But no, everyone just immediately loves and adores She-Hulk. In fact, they love her too much, causing Jennifer to get upset, because all this praise and attention is just embarrassing. Relatable. And man, she still just looks so stupid. Jennifer then trashes the name She-Hulk, saying how dumb it is because she, quote, can't even exist without being derivative from the Hulk. That name better not stick. It's so dumb. I can't even exist without being a derivative of the Hulk. Yes, because you're such an original character, Jennifer. How appalling that the people named you after the guy who gave you his exact powers when you literally sucked up his blood, you goofy looking vampire. But speaking of derivative characters, let's go on a little tangent, shall we? Modern Marvel has many plagues that have been dragging it down over the years. Overbearing comedy, heavy use of multiverses and time travel, and derivative characters, to name a few. Derivatives, or copycats as I prefer to call them, have been created in overwhelming mass in the comics, rapidly bleeding into the films as well. These characters are problematic because they dilute the appeal of the originals. They reduce originality, and often only exist as cheap gimmicks to make big headlines, while lacking any real substance of their own. They are leeches that only become popular by associating themselves with characters who have real success. Their presence is truly tragic though, because Marvel used to flaunt such a wildly impressive and large roster of original heroes, who each had their own clearly defined lane that they would stick to like a puzzle. Hulk is the tragic monster thriller, Captain America is the morality tale, X-Men fight for equality just as much as they fight evil, Silver Surfer is the psychedelic space adventure, and so on. Not every book was perfect, but there was a well-constructed balance that allowed every hero to shine in their own way. But now with all these copycats, the lanes are so polluted with traffic that very little effort is made to maintain originality, and the characters who built the lanes are given much less time and space to shine. Marvel has resorted to the quantity over quality approach, pumping out as many new characters as possible instead of finely tuning them to have a unique footing in this crowded world. Now what does any of this have to do with She-Hulk? Well, She-Hulk is often pointed to as the exception to the rule. Her character was different and interesting enough in her own way that she was essentially able to create her own lane that didn't intrude on the Hulks, and she had a very strong following from comic readers as a result. If any copycat character could thrive in her own adaptation, it would have been her. Though even if Marvel's writers stayed as faithful as possible, they would still be playing the writing game on hard mode due to the current MCU landscape, because there are a large number of reasons why now is not a good time to introduce She-Hulk. Firstly being that She-Hulk has generally been known to be a largely fun and comedic character, but with the overbearing comedy that's already been dominating the MCU lately, adding yet another jokester to the mix is not very appealing. It doesn't help that the style of comedy that this show goes for causes more pain than laughter. Secondly, the Hulk is already a horribly underdeveloped character, in desperate need of more screen time, having gotten the majority of his character development between films. Creating a derivative character for him at this point only adds to the problem instead of solving it. It's hard to give his character any decent direction when he's playing second fiddle to a newer, better version of himself. But that was always the goal, wasn't it? The showrunners weren't concerned about creating a new character with their own lanes for storytelling. They just want to replace the original. There's no discernible difference in their powers, or power levels, aside from her being better. Not to mention that Bruce Banner behaves more like Jennifer these days than he does himself. But it didn't have to be this way. If the writers focused more on what fans enjoy about She-Hulk, instead of using her as a vessel to spout tired social political talking points, this show and this character had the chance to stand out as one of the more well-received products from Phase 4. But that isn't what we're getting. Instead, she's yet another derivative character eating away at the scraps of the original, just like all the rest. With all that in mind, let's get back to the show. And oh boy, we're just in time for the man to return and poison the air with his jealous insecurity. 
take a lap, Dennis. Thankfully, he doesn't stick around too long because he sees a hot chick and says he wants to talk to it. There's a hot chick over there. I'm going to go talk to it. And I swear, there is a double agent that infiltrated Marvel's writing staff and is just having a laugh by putting all these lines in. Bestie then talks to Jennifer about joining the Avengers, but she's a lawyer and she says superhero stuff is for billionaires and orphans. That's clearly an obnoxious thing to say, but maybe it's the seed for an arc that's being planted, where she learns to respect what it means to truly be a hero. We shall see. In any case, she also brings up a good point by asking if the Avengers get pay and benefits, because it's pretty unclear if they do. But of course, like any good question that Marvel writers bring up, we get no answers because their conversation gets interrupted. Jennifer's boss wishes to speak to her, but he gets intimidated by her size and asks her to become a normal human. Jennifer complies, only to stumble over like a drunken clown, because apparently her her normal metabolism can't handle all the drinking her Hulk form can. Oh, so that explains how she got drunk in the last episode. Except it doesn't because she only acted that way to trick Bruce, despite the fact that she drank a shit ton more than she did in the current episode. Yet now, for some reason, she's a stumbling mess who can barely keep her head up. So the Hulk drinking mechanics are even more confusing than they used to be. Dear Marvel writers, when you create rules, please stick to them, lest you make yourselves out to be pinheaded. They only really do this though, because otherwise this would be a serious conversation, and we just can't have that. The goobers who watch this show would get bored and wander off if they didn't have constant funnies to keep their attention. Meanwhile, the boss explains to Jennifer that her fight in the courtroom caused a mistrial, and she is now getting fired for being a liability. Now, it's believable that a company could make a dumb rash decision like that, but here's where the problem lies. The media and public absolutely adore Jennifer. Imagine if Johnny Depp's law firm fired Camille Vazquez after his trial because they deemed her closing argument too aggressive or something along those lines. Could you imagine the firestorm that would erupt on social media as a result of that? The same logic applies here. The public would be outraged to learn that Jennifer got fired from this stunt, and the PR nightmare alone would probably get her rehired within the week. That's why the negative press that I described earlier would make much more sense. If Jennifer was receiving overwhelming unjustified hate, then it would make much more sense that she would also get unjustly fired since the law firm wouldn't want to catch her heat. It would also make her character more tragic and easier to empathize with. She did nothing wrong, she saved people, and they know that, but they hate her anyway just because she's a Hulk. But no, instead of that we get this shallow leap in logic. But hey, at least there's an upside to this, because now Jennifer is jobless and she has a struggle to deal with. She applies to many new jobs, but no one will hire her. Again, this is a good thing. We love seeing our heroes struggle and overcome adversity, but it only gets worse because, uh-oh, Jennifer has to attend an awkward family dinner. Relatable, am I right? This scene only really serves as a comedy bit, but then Jennifer's dad pulls her aside for a private conversation. And behold, dear viewer, for I have something nice to say. Jennifer opens up about her struggles, and her father gives her positive advice on how to stay motivated. And surprisingly, she actually listens and shows him respect and gratitude for his help, as opposed to being rude and dismissive the way she was with Bruce. This scene was a brief refreshment because it was largely played straight, with no goofy shenanigans getting in the way. Her father is the first man in the show who isn't a complete doofus, and it was nice to see Jennifer embrace help without being nasty about it. That said, there are still a few cracks in this gem. But I wasn't going to just let those people get hurt. No. What kind of person would that make me? And now I feel like I'm being punished for doing the right thing. This line of dialogue is ironic, considering her bestie had to beg her to do something. Do your thing. Oh, no. Oh, oh. Right now, in front of everybody? Yes. Yes. Come on. Civic duty. Jen, come on. Oh, God, I really like this outfit. And she only agreed after making sure her shoes were safe. If you want both of these scenes to work while still maintaining the joke, just reverse the roles from the earlier scene. Have Jennifer be the one that wants to help people, but Bestie keeps stopping her for superficial reasons like shoes and publicity. Bestie knows that those things would normally bother Jennifer, but when innocent lives are on the line, Jennifer doesn't consider them at all. That way, you can still do the funny while establishing heroic qualities within your hero. Conversely, if you don't want her to have heroic qualities yet, with her learning them over time, then don't have lines like this, because that creates a contradiction, and it sends a confusing message to the audience. A more bad faith argument would suggest that Jennifer is a liar who is spinning the story to make herself seem more virtuous. Otherwise, good job show, you weren't completely incompetent here. However, don't think this review is turning positive because there are still more shenanigans afoot. 
Jennifer goes drinking at a bar, and a new character appears to give her a job, meaning her struggle lasted less than five minutes before getting resolved. She loses her job, visits family, then gets a new job. Riveting stuff. It turns out that this new guy was the one who declared a mistrial due to her earlier fight, which ended up just being a manipulation to get her fired so he could hire her instead. Are we following along here? And then we cut to the first day on the job. It turns out that the new boss wants her to lead a superhero division for their law firm, and therefore she must be She-Hulk the entire time. Time. People are startled at the sight of her Hulk form, which is understandable. I mean, just look at her. And Jennifer is peeved, because even though she was desperate for a job and was hand-gifted a free new one, specifically made with her in mind, she's upset because people will think she got the job because she's She-Hulk, and not because of her qualifications. This sucks. I am totally qualified, but now everyone around here is always going to think this is the only reason I got the job. It's so unfair. Even though... She was hired solely based on the fact that she was She-Hulk and not because of her qualifications. If she was not She-Hulk, she would not be getting this job. But it's her own fault that she's in this situation anyway. She just accepted this job without learning any details about it. You got me fired, now you want to hire me. To be head of a new division, yes. Take some time. I accept. But honestly, most people would be grateful to go from being unemployed to getting a prestigious, high-paying job exclusively tailor-made for them. She gets this massive, amazing office, but all she can do is complain. This, this is very fancy, best. I'm gonna have to buy an entirely new wardrobe just to come to work. Iron Man was captured and tortured by terrorists until he built his own freedom. Black Widow was brainwashed and mutilated in order to become the perfect spy. Captain America sacrificed himself and froze for 70 years, losing nearly everyone and everything he ever cared for when he got out. But I'm sorry you got this massive office because you're green, Jennifer. On top of that, there's more confusion about the rules in this world. In the first episode, it seemed that Bruce could hear her when she broke the fourth wall, but now she does it and no one seems to notice. I guess it just works however the writers want it to at any given moment. She gets her first case and trouble arises because she has to defend for the abomination. She doesn't want to do it for obvious reasons, but the new boss puts her job on the line if she refuses. Everyone around here is always going to think this is the only reason I got the job. It's so unfair. They mention that Abomination may receive a controversial release from prison, which is a bit hard to believe considering... <laughs> Regardless, Jennifer chooses to meet with him before deciding if she'll represent him or not. She goes to this high security prison, but they don't let her in while she's in her Hulk form because no superpowers are allowed inside. The rule makes sense, sure, but guys, you know she can turn the green on and off like a switch, right? It doesn't matter what form she's in, the powers are still readily available at any given moment. And what if someone like Bruce or Captain America tries to visit? Are people like them just banned from entry? Jennifer would still be more dangerous than Captain America, even though she's only entering in her human form. Odd rule, but I assume it's because they're running out of Hulk budget for this episode. I appreciate this security guard, because when Jennifer tries to start her goofs and gaffs, he immediately shuts her down. So you gonna serve me up with some fava beans and a nice kid? Ma'am, this is a prison. Of course. Thank you, good sir. Jennifer meets with Abomination, but it turns out that he can control his transformation too, and just chooses to be human now. So I guess everyone is just a better Hulk than Hulk is these days. Now simply going by Emil Blonsky, he goes on a sob story about how the super soldier serum caused his malicious behavior, and it's not fair that he be treated like the villain while the Hulk is praised as a hero. But again, why is the Hulk being celebrated as a hero? Hulk spent most of his time on Earth being treated as a rage monster before traveling to space for several years. Then after returning, he was stuck as Bruce Banner for the time skip only recently becoming <clears throat> smart Hulk. Has the public really turned around that quickly from fearing and hating him to loving him just as much as the other Avengers? Sure, people warmed up to him after the events of the first Avengers film, but then this happened. In regards to Blonsky himself, there's an argument if the super soldier serum made him lose control of himself, but that's just a plea for insanity. And he has some hefty charges considering he killed a lot of people. Not to mention he still has access to that great and terrifying power, so it's not the best idea to just let him roam free. That in mind, it doesn't seem like there's much of a case here. In spite of that, Jennifer just eats up his sob story and is quickly swayed into representing him. Wow, what a great lawyer. However, before she accepts the job, she calls Bruce to get his approval first. Hey Jen, what's up? Or rather, she's just telling Bruce that she's accepting the job regardless of how he feels. I think you're calling me to tell me you're taking the job. I'm calling you to tell you I'm taking the job, yes. Thankfully, Bruce is okay with it anyway, because Blonsky wrote him a nice letter and a haiku. 
so all is forgiven. In the comics, Abomination was one of the Hulk's longest running and most dangerous rivals, but here in the MCU, they're pen pals who share poems and love letters. Thrilling stuff. Bruce also mentions that it's fine because the fight was so long ago and he's a different person now. Which is funny because it's literally true. The call ends with Bruce saying he won't be around for a while since he has some stuff he needs to take care of. As we cut to him traveling through space in the UFO that visited earlier. Well alright then, I guess that addresses the UFO subplot, so I suppose we'll just have to wait and see what happens with that. It's remarkable how good his cell service is beyond the stars. Afterwards, Jennifer calls her new boss to tell him she accepts Blonsky's case. New boss replies by telling her to watch the news, and whoopsie, apparently Abomination escaped from prison and joined the underground fight club we see in Shang-Chi, which is in China. And somehow he managed to pull this off without Jennifer finding out at all. And there's even an ADR line that implies he did this the same day he met with Jennifer. Ms. Walters, this is Holden Holloway. I expect to hear your decision by the end of today. What is going on here? The only possible explanation is that Wong portaled him there for some mysterious reason. Time will tell, but something else worth pointing out is that the news reporter refers to Jennifer, saying that the Abomination's attorney has yet to make a statement on his escape, even though she just decided to be his attorney literal seconds before seeing this news report. Was this news report scene directed by a completely different team of people that had no interactions with the original showrunners? That's what it feels like, and it wouldn't be the first time Marvel did this. But that's where our episode ends, with a post credit scene of Jennifer doing silly chores as She-Hulk. And once again, we can be thankful that this mess is finally over. You do seriously surprise me. Thank you. You surprise me to how shit you are.